All right, and Dre, if you want to introduce what we're doing today. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. This is our Phoenix class on Zoom with Fina Moda. And uh, so far, we have done straight varietals, and then we did a rosé, which was a blend. But this is our first time doing one of our red blends. And so we're super excited to talk about the blend itself, Phoenix, which is a little bit different every year. But we're also really excited to talk about our process of how we create a blend because when we are making straight varietals, it's really important that we try to stay to true varietal characteristics. But when it comes to a blend, we get to do whatever we want. And so we get to really let our creative um, juices flow. Juices flow, <laughs> yes. And uh, it's a lot of fun for us. So it's exciting to be able to talk about the Phoenix. And even if you don't have a bottle of the 2017 Phoenix, which we sent out in the wine club shipment, I feel like the Phoenix has been around long enough now that um, that you can kind of conjure up, if you don't have it available, you can conjure up the flavor profile and the characteristics so that uh, even if you're not sipping on it, you can join in the discussion and enjoy that. So, um, I wanted to lead off with the inspiration behind Phoenix and our first Phoenix blend that we ever made was the 2014 Phoenix and we made that in 2016. So I would like Nate to talk about that. All right. Um, so 2014, that was our first year. Um, we have a new vineyard or had a new vineyard, especially at that point. Um, the, the guy named Calvin um, down just outside of Waterford, uh, asked me what he would like me to start um, growing for me. And I had to take into account what grows best down in the valley. And it's kind of where Waterford is. It's where the Sierra foothills kind of comes down and, and becomes the valley. So I, I did some research into that area and just what varietals grow best. And that's in the same Appalachian AVA as Lodi. So I knew Zinfandel did great there. I mean, Lodi Zins are world renowned, but uh, in my in my preference between Zinfandel and Primitivo, I had him plant Primitivo, and Primitivo is the mother clone of Zinfandel. So, hundred over a hundred years ago, the Italians brought Primitivo to the United States and planted it all over, especially in the Sierra foothills region, and they called it Zinfandel when it was actually Primitivo. So for years, there was a big dispute of, is Zinfandel and Primitivo the exact same thing? Well, it, it very much is the same thing in the origin, but Zinfandel for a hundred and some years being grown here like it has been, it's now, it's now uh, morphed a little bit. So its DNA is just slightly off from what Primitivo is. So through all the DNA, um, uh, everybody yeah <laughs> all the DNA evolution and uh, everything it's they were able to give Zinfandel an American AVA of Zinfandel because it's just slightly different than the mother clone Primitivo now but in tasting the two there's so much Zinfandel out there in the world I really enjoy Primitivo it's a big deep more blue fruit than the red Zinfandel and it still has a spiciness, but not quite as peppery spicy as a Zinfandel. So I uh, had him plant Primitivo, and then the other varietal I had him do was Tanat. And it's a not very well-known varietal, Tanat, but I ended up going to Sobon up in Amador, and they had a reserve Tanat, and it was one of the best wines. I mean, hands down, amazing wine. So, um, when he asked me and he said, I'm only going to plant a small little like quarter acre of this vineyard, I said, hey, will you please do Tanat? And he, I actually had to twist his arm a little bit for him to, to plant it because he'd never even heard of it. So with that, that is how the Phoenix started to become. I finally started to get production of Primitivo and Tanat from this vineyard. And as we tasted it, it was a little bit more of a peppery, spicy. Um, blend and it was um, primarily Primitivo driven and that's how all of our all of the Phoenix is Primitivo driven but um, in the very first year it ended up the uh, we worked with Grenache so that was one of the very best 
best blends that we could come up with in the uh, Tanat that year didn't really produce. So we really didn't hardly get anything from the Tanat. So um, that was not even an option really in 2014. So 2014, the blend became Primitivo, Grenache, Syrah, and Cinso. And Cinso is another grape that's very rare. You hardly ever hear of it, but it's an extremely fruit forward and almost has a bubble gum quality to it. It's just so candied quality and just such a awesome blending wine because it'll soften the edges on any big uh, tannic bread. And so um, first year we ended up uh, making the Phoenix and then also also with the Phoenix blend, the name the Phoenix, where that really came from is just the evolution of Vinamoda to start with. We started, I've, I started Vinamoda in 2003 and then I entered into a partnership. I didn't have enough financial backing in the very beginning to fully make Vina Moda run. So I ended up partnering in with another um, company and that didn't last all that long. That it was a whole like year, year and a half that that, that whole thing lasted. And then Vina Moda died for a little while. We lost our building, lost our facility, lost our backing. Um, I had to go to work for, I actually had to go back to pounding nails and pouring concrete for a living for a little bit. And then I ended up hiring on with the Renner Winery. But I said, hey, the one thing, if I'm going to make wine for anybody as a full-time winemaker, I said, you have to allow me to make Vina Moda out of your facility. And so Renner back in the day said, sure, come on board, make all my wine, and I'll allow you to do Vina Moda with it. And then we did that for a little while. And then the transition out of that, the doctor ended up becoming sick and his business was was starting to uh, to uh, not be his forefront. So I ended up at that point moving to Villa Vallecito Vineyards. And then right after that, the doctor passed away. So again, I had to go and change all my licensing, all new paperwork, all new everything and start Vinamoda again at a new facility. And then Villa Vallecito, I've been there all of this time making their wine as well as Vinamoda's wine. And now we're moving to our new facility this year. So we're going to have to change all our paperwork all over again and restart Vinamoda as a new entity again. So this will be uh, five times now that we've fully started Vinamoda from scratch. This will be the final time and It'll the best. It'll be the final time. It'll be our own facility, <laughs> yeah. our own land. But the name The Phoenix came from that. I felt like constantly we were tested and tried and we rose from the ashes over and over again. And so that's where the Phoenix, I always wanted a blend that, that was the Phoenix rising from the ashes and becoming what it is at this point. So that's where we, the very first. And then the reason we make the Phoenix the way we make the Phoenix is I, in my vision, I see the Phoenix and the fire and the flames as more of my desert blend. It's a spicier, um, more of a warm, just, desert blend whereas the venus that we make is just the sexy woman sultry super jammy fruit forward um more on the blue fruit side blue and a little almost colder uh darker and so i have the venus on one hand and then the phoenix is its polar opposite um on the other hand so that's where the whole thing of the phoenix came from in the beginning and then our first Phoenix, the 2014, um, when we made it in 2016, we, our entire community had experienced the Butte fire in the fall of 2015. And so it was very fresh on our minds in January of 2016 when we created this blend <clears throat> um, that our community was, was also rising from the ashes. And so we dedicated that first year of Phoenix to um, the survivors of the Butte fire in 2015 and proceeds from that entire vintage went to families that were uh, still needing permanent housing, still needing help winterizing trailers, needing clothing, things like that. So we always had a list of five families that needed help um, because we wanted to give them a significant donation rather than sending it to you know the, the Red Cross or anything and so we had five families on the list at, at all times and then when a family would then get permanent housing or not need our help anymore then they would recommend another family to take their place and so it was also 
of course, our rise from the ashes over and over again at Bina Moda, but also dedicated to our community's rise from the ashes uh, when we released it in 2016. And we, we held an event on the one year anniversary of the Butte Fire in September of 2016 to also raise funds for families that, that continued to need help with that. And, um, and it was cool because several of those families came to that event and were able to give their thanks and gratitude and, and actually meet us and meet too. us. And yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was fantastic. Yeah. So that's, I mean, both of those, those things have just really inspired the Phoenix blend. And I want to say too, when we do our blending trials, um, it's, it's, definitely an intricate process. It's a lengthy process. It doesn't happen all in one day. Um, it's art and chemistry and science and all those things. And, and we, Nate and I do some of it together, just the two of us. And then we also bring in our crew for part of it. And then we usually try to bring in another person or two that's not on our crew to give us feedback of what like other palettes are, because we tend to lean towards the Vena Moda palette. And so we want to be palatable to everyone. Um, but when we were creating the 14 Phoenix, um, we didn't even really plan to create it at first, but we had been through blending trials. It, it, we had been going for a few hours. And then Nate went outside and looked up at the stars for a while. And then he came back in and he just said, shh, don't talk to me. And he just started putting stuff together and we, that was the 14 Phoenix. It was just very, very inspired by, I don't know, just Nate's creativity of being open to whatever the universe decided to, to send him at that moment after hours of blending. And, uh, and we tried tweaking it a few different ways to see if we could perfect it any more than that. And we couldn't. And then that first year, that 14 Phoenix uh, earned a best of class and double gold designation. So that was pretty exciting to just have such an inspired creation that, that really was from the bottom of, of our hearts and our souls and, and really meant a lot to our community as well. So um, we weren't sure if we would make another Phoenix after that, but, but what we discovered is that the Primitivo that Calvin grows for us, it is just meant to be the backbone of the Phoenix. And so um, that's, that is what we do with it every year. We know that that Primitivo will become Phoenix. It's just, it's destiny. So, um, and then we also had, in addition to that other event, we had our very first Phoenix party. Um, I've lost track of time. So Jess, what was it a year and a half ago? <laughs> it wasn't this last year. It was 2019. 2019. So prior yes. to that, for our summer party, we'd always done the Venus Festival. And then we skipped a year of Venus in 2016. And we were like, you know, we've never done a Phoenix party. And so that was really awesome. And so once we can do events again, we're really excited to, to bring that back and do another Phoenix party because just really bringing the elements together uh, was so fun to do. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I feel like, Vicki, were you there? Vicki Brooks? Were you at the Phoenix party? Vicki, were you there? Oh, can't get off mute. There I go. Um, I was at the Barbera party. I don't remember being at the Phoenix okay. party. Okay. I was thinking that you wore something with wings. And so I was thinking that oh, it was the Phoenix. No, so that was, uh, shoot. That was somebody else. Okay. Yes, I, I was making okay. And uh, so, if you ever ask me the party attire for an event, maybe ask Dre because <laughs> I keep leading people astray. So, um, we had our Phoenix party, and then she talked about the Venus Festival. Well, um, that was a toga party, so we would dress up in togas. And so, for the Phoenix party, um, somebody asked if we were dressing up and I'm like, I live in Calvary County. Like anytime we wear like a dress, that's getting dressed up. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm getting dressed up. Like I'm going to wear a red dress cause it's Phoenix. <laughs> and three people showed up in like Phoenix bird costumes. But obviously they looked, not you, Vicky. Sorry. <laughs> they looked amazing, but like, we had they were the only lots of costumes, so it was a, it was a good yeah. guess. Okay. <laughs> well, and we have costume parties, so it makes sense. But I I didn't mean that we were gonna dress up as phoenixes, <laughs> but they were gonna like 
look nice. <laughs> so, yes. yeah, just always clarify if you're asking me. Yes, if you're asking dress, if it's a dress up party, because that is not the only couple or the only people that she's ever done that to um, with the dressing up. So dressed up versus dressing up. Very important distinction when asking Jess about party attire. I remember you did that at Villa Vallecito and that one couple showed up and they just joined the wine club. They didn't know anybody and they joined and they came dressed as like jesters or clowns or something. And everybody <laughs> else was in nice wardrobes and nice everything. And there was this poor couple in like this crazy Well, then the Arabian gaudy. Nights party too. Yes, they came well, dressed. Yeah. As people thought that they were uh like hired entertainment because <laughs> they were the only ones dressed up <laughs> so yes clarify <laughs> but we do wear togas to the venus party yeah. we do and you don't have to but uh, but we do that and then we also wanted to talk about um the artwork for the phoenix and so most of our bottles have um similar labels so that they're very uh jess's looks symmetric better. oh jess's looks better okay i have too much light on my um and so joseph steck is our graphic designer he's been involved with being Moda since the very very beginning he's the one that designed our labels he designed our logo um he's just very very talented he's the one that designed and created our website is it he's cutting out for anyone else oh. no okay no okay um he's just very very talented and he really gets the style behind vina moda um he just really really gets us and gets it. And so when we contacted him and said, Hey, Joseph, we're creating this wine. It's called Phoenix. We want it to be this magnificent bird rising from the ashes. Um, and he said, well, do you have anything in mind? And we were like, well, we're not designers, um, especially not art designers. And so we just said, come up with something and show it to us. And when he sent it over, I literally cried. It's just so beautiful. Um, and if you've ever looked at the label, he even has tendrils of smoke rising from it. Um, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And it is such a special label because it does alter from what our typical label looks like, although it does bring those elements into play as well. Um, but I just absolutely love it. And it's still every year when we get our fresh batch of labels for our next vintage, I look at it and I just have to, to pet it a little bit. And I know it's Jess's favorite label as well. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit since uh, hopefully everyone has a 2017 Phoenix or a different vintage. I uh, wanted to have Nate walk us through the 2017. Do you still have 2016? Or 17. Okay. So he's got the 2017 Venus, or not Venus, for you, the Phoenix in his glass. We also have the 2016 Phoenix that we'll be talking about in tasting. But I wanted him to walk through some of the uh, aromas and flavors of the 2017 Phoenix. Um, at, while he's sipping on it so that we can discuss that in the class. Okay. Um, so 2017 very, very firstly is the um, little bit of spice and pepper. Um, that's one of the things that stands out of, amongst all of our wines that we do. This is the only one that has that kind of traditional Zinfandel slash Primitivo, that little peppery spiciness in the beginning. And then this wine leads itself right into onto the red red fruit um, side. And let me look up. So traditionally in our in our uh, Phoenix blends, it goes Phoenix, it goes Primitivo first, then Tanat. But this year in particular, um, Petite Syrah was our secondary. And so we needed something. The Primitivo came out in 17, just very spicy. And it was almost to a point where it was, it was just not, it wasn't quite palatable to what Vinamoda and that smoothness that we always try to achieve. And so with the Tanat, which is a fairly tannic wine, it was just over the top. So we ended up bringing Petit Syrah, one of the darkest wines in the world, into it, but also one of the most fruit forward wines. So it really brought the fruit backing with that spiciness. And then um, the last ingredient to the Primitivo in 17 was Morved. 
and Morbed is a very earthy um, seductress. I really love Morbed. And also spicy, but in a different way. Yeah, and she's slightly spicy, but yeah, in a different way and uh, more on the blue fruit side. So that brought that little bit of blue to back that Primitivo little bit of blue that was in it. But it very much became like uh, a fruit forward wine with nice spicy undertones to it. And so we've really been enjoying this and it's with that blend that we have, it's really become a really good food pairing wine. So we've had some really nice pairings um, with it, but just overall flavor complexity is a nice spiciness, very fruit forward, um, a little spicy on the tongue as well, but not overly tannic. It has a nice smooth finish um, that, that, uh, leaves you lingering and a nice long finish but also leaves you still thirsty wanting more so that's something we always try to to perfect as well um, so with this 2017 we produced 332 cases total um, and then we're recommending you can enjoy it now or sell it up to 12 years and I'll just read you the tasting notes for it really quick um, and I assume these are all wine club members so I assume you're already uh, familiar with the way that we do our tasting notes which we don't want to tell you what you're supposed to smell and taste because we want you to have that experience for yourself and if we tell you what you're supposed to smell and taste then you spend all of your time looking for that and it can be very intimidating as well as if you don't smell or taste that then you think maybe you're not doing it right or, or whatever so we try to tell you a story and in that story we also try to give you hints of, of what we detect in the wine and, and what the wine story is and so of course with the phoenix we always uh incorporate the the fire to that so this one is in my dreams fiery ribbons and billowing shades from plum to blood orange dance to the cadence of an anarchic symphony as branches sway and moan far below i have learned that fire is both a beginning and an end and an end a curious place where desolation and hope waft together in spirals locked in an eternal em embrace as their tendrils reach for the sky above so in that one, we talked about the plum to blood orange, and that's Nate talking about more of the blue fruit and, uh, and the darker fruit from the Maved and to blood orange. So it's got red, but it also has a little bit of that hint of citrus to it and uh, just the way they blend together and, and balance each other so well. And then we wanted to talk a little bit about our blending process. Um, um, so we talked about the blending components of the 2017, but um, I'd love Nate to walk us through a little bit the way that we go through the blending process in our blending trials, because I know we usually share photos and talk about blending trials and how much we love them, but uh, blending trials are one of our favorite times of year, and especially when it comes to the blends where we can really uh, experiment and have a lot of fun. So Nate, would you like to walk us through that? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so as Dre said, blending is one of, the, one of our favorite times of the season. Everybody thinks the winemaking business and winemaking is so uh, sexy and romantic. Glamorous. Glamorous <laughs> and all of us just sparkle and diamonds everywhere. But um, most of the time, probably 90% of the time, we're dirty, grubby, covered in grape juice. Um, it's just it's hard laborious work it really is and especially the way we do it we don't have quite all as fancy of equipment as some places in napa but um most of it is very hard work and we're usually in our grubby clothes that we don't want to get stained in wine and and covered in wine and when it comes to blending trials we don't look pretty but it's very uh it's it's the creation time it's the time when, I, I don't know, I feel like it's the birth of a new child and you don't know what that child's going to look like or, or be like or the personality. And it's fantastic when we sit down and start going through each wine. And I absolutely love the point when we get to, to get into the blend side of it. Normally with making Barbera, we pretty much know our Barbera is very consistent. We know what goes with Barbera. And I, so I guess I'd have to take you one step further back. Certain varietals, they're like children. Some play well with others, some do not. So 
some are just little brats they won't blend with anything nothing can go into them and they make everything else terrible so certain wines we have to be very careful with to make sure we never have cross-contamination with them barbera is one of those um what's another merlot merlot uh sagrantino um several of those varietals you just they don't play well with others so when we get to the blend part of the the um, experience that's when the options are just limitless so i'll go back to barbera barbera is one it's our flagship but there's only about two varietals that can actually go into barbera and just minute doses of those um, and that's just to round the rough edges so when we take a straight varietal say barbera um, it's the most acidic grape in the world so when we taste it as soon as we taste it we're going it's acid everywhere i mean it's like lemon juice and you're going oh my god and there's like good parts of it but then there's like the finish sometimes just hits you in your throat and you get the salivation you feel like you need to eat a couple tums right away so then we say okay our customers cannot do that so they can't have that so we've got to smooth and round that finish so you don't get that like um acidic finish on that yeah. so then we'll taste through what else we have to work with syrah is one of the best it plays well with everything syrah will go into any varietal no matter what and it'll add something and, and, smooth petite something. Syrah as well, most and then the petite syrah as well and then grenache is another one that really does well with others um so we'll taste those wines and we'll see okay what has a really nice smooth finish um on it and then that is what we'll start playing with and we'll try it at five percent and at ten percent and at fifteen percent and then we'll say or maybe the the uh, beginning mouthfeel is too tannic. So we need to add something soft to like Senso or, or like a, 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 a Grenache or something. Those will help in the beginning. And then especially like long finishes, Petite Syrah is one of the grapes we use to blend into almost everything because it really just adds that long lingering finish. I hate a wine when it goes in, it's powerful, impactful, and then it just goes away and you feel like you've almost been cheated. So um, when we get to certain varietals like Barbera, we know the few things that'll work. We tweak what we need to tweak, but that's about as far as we can really take that wine. We can't go further. Um, most of our varietals are that way. They, we know what goes well and how, how they'll play together. But when we get to the blends, th there's no hold barred at that. Nothing we, and that blends are our very hardest because we're starting with a clean slate of all these varietals and I can pick and choose. I can take Cabernet. I can take any varietal we do and bring it into this blend. So that's where it really gets complex and creative because we know. So for instance, the Phoenix is always going to be Primitivo driven. It's it's that's the Phoenix and that's a flavor profile we're going after. But then I have to not and then I have like 12 other varietals to work on. So we taste and every single year it's different. Sometimes a Primitivo is a little bit spicier. Sometimes it's a little more acidic. Um, sometimes it's just flat like this last year, he overcropped it a little bit. So we had to go in and drop a bunch of fruit, but it was just not quite as impactful. So I had to bring in other players like Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, Tempranillo. Tempranillo has been a huge blender into my program just to add that little bit of weight and power into it. So, um, in certain years, what you thought worked last year doesn't always work because Mother Nature doesn't play it that way. So um, the blends are always a place where we have our deepest reflection and our most creativity. And honestly, a lot of the times, just most frustration because yes. it's it is not easy to start from zero. And then we can only really do about seventy five blends in one day. Because then and our palates, our are, palates shot. are shot. So during the blending trials, we're, we're uh, eating bacon. Bacon's a huge, huge saver in what we do. I eat these uh, white butter crackers that are just amazing. Um, we all have our different, some, some of the crew like uh, sourdough bread. Um, or nuts. rice crackers. Yeah, rice crackers, some, some different nuts. Um, but... All of these things are helping our to keep our uh, palate 
Can we <laughs> sip on a little bit of beer or Sierra Rose sometimes? Yes. If we're getting and, super yeah, burnt. Yeah. A little bit of beer with the effervescence. I like Sierra Nevada, so occasionally every like hour I'll have to have a little bit of beer in between. We'll eat some food, we'll take a break, go for a little walk, take our dogs for a hike, and then come back and sit down again. But we really, after a point, your your palate really burns and you don't have that much, you just don't have it. And you think you do, your brain tells you to keep drinking, but at that point we keep drinking and we quit trying to blend. Yeah. So we just <laughs> call it a night. Well, and on but, the 2017 Phoenix, interestingly, uh, we tried 47 different blends. And when you think of 47 different blends, um, not only do we have to taste them all, and we didn't do them all in one day, but- And it takes several days. It takes that. several days, but every time we do blending trials, we have to go and, and take samples out of the barrels and each varietal, we need to have an aggregate sample um, that's coming out of the different barrels because of the barrel program is a little bit different for, for each one. And so that takes about two hours. And then um, when we're measuring it, we've got a little graduated cylinder. Nate's usually that person. <laughs> yeah, so we have to take like 80 milligrams or however much fits in a 750. So if we have a 750 milliliter bottle and I have 10 barrels only 75 milliliters are gonna go into that bottle. So you do the math, you run that, and so I take 75 mil from each 10 barrels. That way we have a aggregate sample of- This our is our graduated thing. cylinder here. <laughs> Has all the numbers and all the- It goes up to 10, it. and so when we're creating the blends, uh, each 10 uh, milliliters, uh, equals one barrel. And so we do it in, in number of barrels and then we can take the barrels all the way down to one sixteenth of a barrel when we're blending it. And so it, there's a lot of math and, and blending and mixing it. And then we have to kind of aerate it and blend it back and forth and then we can taste it. And then we can sometimes know immediately, no, that's no good. Well, we've just spent five minutes doing that. Um, but with the 2017 Phoenix on the 47 blends that we tried, we had gotten to, I would say number 30 and it was day three and we don't do them back to back because we need to let our, our palates. We do it every other day. Yeah. We need to let our palates recover and our bodies. Um, but we brought in another person just to taste everything and just let us know like an outsider's perspective of how it tastes. And she said, I don't like it. I think that you need to go a different direction. And so we just had to throw out all 30 and go another direction. And we were so grateful for her because 17 more and we, and we nailed it. Um, but sometimes that's what it takes. And it's like that with the blends, but, but like Nate said, it's not so much like that with the straight varietals because we're, we're keeping to the varietal characteristics and there's only so much we can do as, whereas with the blends, it's, you know, infinity it's, it's endless yeah <laughs> and we way. can love it and then someone else comes and is just like you know i don't like that and then we have to go oh shoot we got lost we went down the rabbit hole and we got lost and we're so grateful it was our friend tasha she has a great palette um that just said you know i think you need to go in another direction and so even though we had already tried 30 different ways we just threw it all out the window and started over and uh, and nailed it. I, I think with the 17 Phoenix, it's wonderful. It's a little bit different from some of the other Phoenixes, but I feel like it really represents the, the actual Phoenix very, very well, even though it's different. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the two Phoenixes that haven't been released yet. The 2019 Phoenix, which is what we're getting ready to bottle. We'll be bottling that in April. And that one is 56% Primitivo, because um, as Nate said, the Primitivo uh, was a little bit stronger in that year. And so we needed to do a little bit less of Primitivo in the overall. 36% to not 4% Tempranillo and 4% Cabernet Franc, which this is the first time Cabernet Franc has played a role in the Phoenix, which, and it's also the first year that we worked with it um, for the last several years. We used to work with it a while ago. And then the 2018 Phoenix, which if any of you uh, attended the um, new release event that we did last June, or if you'd purchased the 18 Phoenix in the meantime, that one is 74% Primitivo, 20% to not, 3% Tempranillo, and then 3% Cabernet Sauvignon, which that was the first time uh, Cab Sauv had played a role in the Phoenix. And then the other, one that we have um, that Nate and I are sipping on tonight is the 2016 Phoenix. And we do have a few bottles in the tasting room. Jess, did you happen to notice how many bottles we have left of that? It's not overall, but what we have 
available. Eight bottles. Eight bottles. So we have eight bottles of the 16 Phoenix in the tasting room. Uh, Nate and I did take one today. So uh, we did have nine. Now we have eight. And yes. And so uh, we'll have Nate go ahead and um, and taste and talk about that a little bit. But uh, the 2016 Phoenix, in addition to the 2014 Phoenix being a best of class, the 2016 Phoenix was also best of class of region at the California State Fair. And um, Anytime we get a best of class or a double golds or both, it's it's literally the best award that we could possibly win on a wine. And and when you're competing for blends, there's there's not a standard. And so we just really never know how we're going to hold up against other blends because there's there's nothing else that's going to be exactly like ours. Other people's are not gonna be the same as anybody else's. So when you're going varietal to varietal, people are, the judges are looking for specific characteristics. But when you're doing the blend, you have to have the, the proper structure. You have to have the, you have to have perfection from start to finish and everything in between. You have to have layers, you have to have complexity, you have to have mouthfeel, you have to have just everything really well balanced. And so anytime we win a best of class or double gold, it, it's such an honor, but especially to win a best of class or double gold for a blend just really, really is something special. Um, so well, I'll read that. Blends the, are a huge category too. Huge. Huge. And there's no base. There's no yeah. base like for them to start from. So I'll read the tasting notes on it really quick. And then I'd love for Nate to talk about it a little. Um, okay, so the Phoenix soars above foreign lands, his lonely cry heard only by those who ache for the warmth of his magnificent embrace. He collects them one by one and they search for a home that seems only to exist in the depths of their dreams. As his mighty wings become weary on the brink of despair, their peaceful hearts realize at last that home is a place called together and it lives in the world anywhere they choose to belong. And this 2016 Phoenix, we only made 177 cases of that. And this one um, with the backing of Primitivo to not Petite Syrah and Syrah, we are recommending you can sell her that up to 25 years because of such uh, big wines that went into that. And um, and if anyone has a question on that and in, in the chat of, of how we tell you how long you can sell her something because of what goes into it, um, go ahead and ask that question of, of what you'd like to know and then Nate can talk about that as well. Okay, so 2016, I'm tasting it now. It's just so smooth. When I made it, there was more spice to it, more peppery qualities about it. And as it's aged, as, as most of our wines do, um, just really smooth. Some cream has come out from the melolactic fermentation we did. Um, it's... It's my favorite Phoenix since the 2014. Um, absolutely love it. And I don't know, it's, it's the desert blend. I experienced, I feel like I am driving through the desert through Moab um, on a nice like evening when the weather's calm and everything is just very like relaxed, smooth and Tran very tranquil. Do you want to talk about the smells and black fruit? Red fruit? I mean, it is. It goes from plum right into the red. Nice, nice buttercream. Wood program is just talking. You get the vanilla, a little bit of coconut. Yeah. I'm absolutely loving it. So. Awesome. Okay. Um, so that's the 2016. We do have eight bottles, Jess said. So if anybody wants any of that, I did not write down the price of the 2016 currently. I apologize um, for not doing that. Um, and then prior to the 2016, we had the 2015 Phoenix. And that one was the only one that was not Primitivo driven. And that was 70% Alicante Boucher. And then 18% Primitivo, 6% Petite Syrah, 6% Syrah. So we only 
had the one year in 2015 that we were able to work with Alicante Boucher and we were very, very excited to work with it. It was grown by Dvorty Vineyards um, and they are also in the valley. And, and it's one of the only grapes that has black juice. Yeah. So all other grapes are, when you squeeze them, their inside is all clear sugar water. Outside is the skin where all of the flavors, all of the color, everything of the of the, the grape cannons. comes from the skin. The inside is just the sugar water, and that's the sugar we need to make a fermentation happen. So it's it's important, but there's no flavor beyond sugar in the center of a grape. Well, all the Conte Boucher has black juice, so you cut it open and it's jet black on the inside. It's it's absolutely beautiful grape, but. Unfortunately, the almond growers of the world took over and they ripped the whole vineyard of Alicante out and planted almonds in its place. Yes, we were very, very disappointed because we were looking forward to continuing to work with Alicante Boucher. And the interesting thing is with the Alicante, um, when you think about it, having that darkness in the flesh as well as the skins, you would think it would just be this rip roaring, like overwhelming flavor of, of, fruit and then when it and turns tannin. into wine but it was actually extremely velvety and that very floral yes one of the most floral, floral. Wines. yeah and so the interesting thing is as we started working with the tanat once the vineyard started producing um the velvetiness of tanat reminded me of the alicante boucher and even though the tanat does not have uh, the dark flesh um it it kind of mimicked that in a lot of ways of being unexpectedly beautiful and velvety and, and instead of overwhelming um so i'll read the tasty notes for the 2015 we made it um 194 cases of that and i think we in the vault we only have probably five cases left and so whenever we pull that from the vault it will probably be when we have the next phoenix party um, and this one is a very short one. The phoenix will rise on the dark side of morning when the sands of time are ablaze. From the ashes, a whisper blossoms to a roar as magnificent wings fill the heavens with majestic glory. It's a very simple one. Um, and that one also we recommended you can uh, sell her up to 25 years. And that uh, is a lot, has a lot to do with that Alicante Boucher being the primary wine or grape in that. And then we're, we're down to the 2014 Phoenix, which, as Nate mentioned, was the double gold best of class of region at the state fair. And, um, and our, the reason we started making the Phoenix, and I think I mentioned earlier, we weren't sure that we would continue to make the Phoenix. We thought we might just make it that one year. But I don't think that we cannot make it at this point. Um, the Venus at that time was everyone's favorite blend. It's something that kind of put Vinamoda on the map. And so when we came out with another blend that was so different, we just weren't sure if Vinamoda and Vinamoda's clientele had space for two very, very different blends. But it turns out that you absolutely do. The only thing is that we discovered that in the tasting room, and luckily now we're out in the garden, so it's a little bit different, but in the tasting room, we could not have the Venus and the Phoenix on the menu at the same time because it would get very loud in there and when you say Venus or you say Venus it looks exactly the same when you say it and so we couldn't pour them both at the same time and that's why when you come in and we have Phoenix we don't have Venus and when we have Venus we don't have Phoenix um, because we just it's it's way too confusing for, for people and they are just very very different so I'll read the tasting notes for the 2014 Phoenix. And I wanted to say too, so this was our first year making it. And the victims of the Butte Fire were very, very much in the forefront of our minds. And when the Butte Fire, the Butte Fire started in September of 2015, we were still crushing at that time. We still had quite a few. Oh yeah, we had at least four or five more four picks. Four or five more picks at that point in time. Um, Cause it was the end of September and it moved into October. And so, uh, Murphy's was evacuated. A lot of places were evacuated. Luckily, we were not, but we had the fruit coming in from the, the vineyard and it was not smoke tainted because it was too late in the season for the smoke or the ash to really have an effect on the, on the, the grapes themselves. But um, we brought the fruit in and we had to cover it with sheets because ash, chunks of ash were just falling from the sky. We had to wear bandanas and 
not only were chunks of ash falling. It was before N95 masks. Yes, we, we didn't know anything about school, that. We just wore bandanas. bandanas. <laughs> um, but it wasn't just little chunks of ash. It was like photographs falling from the sky. Um, it was pieces of paper. It was books um, burned and, and falling from the sky, landing on the grapes and landing on us as, as we harvested. And we knew that these were pieces of lives of people that we knew this was our community and so that's where the the heart of these tasting notes come from um and i i really have a hard time reading them without crying so i'm going to do my best <laughs> um okay the sky rains memories upon us all pieces of lives singed around the edges forevermore when the inferno wakes the beast called death and destruction it stops for no man its hunger growing with every morsel consumed the screams of the trees echo through canyons and over peaks blackened and charred, snuffing out the light of the sun until the earth is empty and still. And yet, when all was lost and gone, the phoenix lifted its weary head day after day, night after night, planting seeds of hope and love in the barren, stricken soil with every step until finally its wings sought the wind and it rose from its prison of ashes. And my parents actually had some friends that lost their home in the campfire and they just very recently um, created a work of art with those notes, um, with the phoenix in the background with those notes and they had their friend group because they're part of a car club. Um, they all did digital signatures on it and they presented it to them as a housewarming gift in their new home. And it really meant a lot to them. And it meant so much to me that they um, used my words to try to bring someone comfort who was the victim of a fire. Um, so the 2014 Phoenix, we created 135 cases and we recommended cellaring it up to 15 years. And part of that is because the Grenache is a secondary on that. So it's, it's less of a robust wine. And I also wanted, uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Well, there was uh, Monica and Jim want to know, can you tell us how anyone can lay down one of your wines for 25 years? It's too tempting <laughs> to enjoy long before that. And then Deirdre and Dave said, that was a great question. And I also struggle with that. <laughs> so I don't know if you have any tips. I don't know. So for us, we have, uh, what, half a case of our 2003 Cabernet Sauvignon um, that we plan on cellaring a few more bottles and then we're going to drink the rest. Um, but we just put it in storage and didn't touch it. And we knew that it was around but it was buried and so we couldn't find it and of course we drank it for a while but then it reached a certain time where we just buried it okay so from the winemaker winemaker seller what winemakers love to hear and see is that anytime you buy a bottle buy two bottles and drink one save one and put a date on it they yep. sell like silver sharpies you can write on there and you can write on there like the date that you want to save it to and then that way there's no question and then if you want to drink more in the meantime buy more but then just keep that one in the cellar <laughs> um and then i wanted nate to talk a little bit about our barrel program and it, it it varies on based on the vintage but our barrel program is pretty special and it plays a huge role in our wines so I wanted to have Nate talk about Sorry, that. I'm gonna say something sure. really quick before he does. Um, as Nate's about to talk about the barrel program, uh, it made me think of when you're talking of blending trials and how not only with the blends, but also the standalone varietals and like Barbera, we know it's gonna be acidic and mother nature plays a huge role in how each year ends up. But after doing blending trials this year, uh, I feel like there was so much like testimony to show how much better we each year we improve and uh, our barrel program has been dialed in which Nate's going to talk about our hand sorting every technique like Nate is so incredible at what he does because he pushes all of us to be better he pushes himself to be better and this year at blending trials there was so many wines that we had that we were just like this is incredible as exactly as it is, which is a huge compliment to what he's doing, what our crew is doing. And so 
I just wanted to add that before he talks about bar or barrel program because it just seems like uh, we just keep continuing to improve and it's so great because it always is challenging, it's always moving forward and it's always tasting better and better. So I will let you go, Nate, sorry. Thank you, Jess, I appreciate that. No, it is, it is a testament to our whole crew when you can have a great from start to finish be absolutely flawless and we don't have to fix anything. Um, so much of winemaking is being a good caretaker and if you're a good diligent caretaker and you give your utmost respect and time to the to the wine it'll turn out good um, but then some wines are just a little thin or don't quite have the finish or maybe just a little too acidic or a little bit astringent um, but thank god for i was i was actually having a conversation with one of one uh, another client of mine and uh, he was asking me, he said, well, I only want to do these two varietals. And I said, well, if you only do those two varietals, then all you're going to get is those two varietals. I don't have any blending components to try to make your wine better. I don't have anything to add a finish or to soften the middle or to um, cream the front. Um, I don't have any of that ability. So for Vina Moda, we're making about 14 different varietals right now at this time. So I can pick and choose from all these different things to make a complete perfect wine. And so with that, I, I love that we're making the amount of varietals. I love that things are working the way they are. And that's why Vina Moda is really taking over at least Murphy's area and, and our Sierra foothills right now. It's because I do have the blending components to truly make perfect wines. And then the other side of that, not just the grape and the wine side is the barrel program and in my earlier days of winemaking back in the beginning of the 2000s um i so little backstory i started vina moda with five thousand dollars five thousand dollar loan from my grandmother and then i'd been working construction for several years and so i had amassed like thirty forty thousand dollars that I was able to put aside just to launch Vina Moda. And we started from nothing. So barrels are extremely expensive. For brand new French, one, one barrel, a French barrel is $1,200. So that's just one barrel. And I mean, we're making a couple hundred barrels at this point. So you, you look at that kind of price and then uh, American barrel right now is about $450. So American is far cheaper, but it's because we don't have to export all the French wood and all that in. So French barrels are extremely expensive and American is expensive when you're thinking $450 for one barrel and we're doing 200 barrels. I mean, you can just understand the cost of what it all is. And so in the beginning days, we really didn't have the income to go out and just splurge and say, we're buying the best wood and we're doing this. We're we had to just try to buy the best fruit we could at our cost and then just try to blend it right and maybe get a tiny bit of wood influence but and purchase used barrels too and, at first yeah purchase and used and luckily i have like my mentor mike from opus one and guys that have directed me in the right direction and hooked me up with really good deals on barrels as well um but uh at this point now in our game we're we're on top of our game we don't have our business now pays for next year's barrels and pays for the bottling. And I'm not having to hustle and side job on like three other jobs to try to buy a few new barrels. So we're at a point now where Vina Moda is, control, is in control of its own destiny. And for me, that's amazing because that is, thank you, but that is, that's our spice rack. So if you think of being a chef, and I know all of you guys probably cook at home, you got to think of your spice rack. And if you think of like in the beginning days of Inamoto where I was handcuffed, all I had was salt and pepper. So if you think of now, I've got garlic, I've got onion, uh, rosemary, basil, tarragon, tarragon everything you want to think. <laughs> I've got that and I can get that out of all my different barrels. So when you look at barrels, especially like I'm, I'm probably about 65% American, 
versus French. And I don't use Hungarian, I don't use Russian, I don't use any of the other. I only use French and American. But when you look at what you can get in, so just in American barrels, I've got Minnesota American oak, I've got Pennsylvania, I use Virginia. Virginia is one of our backbones. And then we've got Missouri. So all of these different forests from the different parts of the country all infuse different aspects of wine. So you're getting all these different flavors just from being a different forest in, in American. Then when you jump to the French side, there's 15, 20 different forests in France that all impart a different flavor. So certain varietals like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cab Franc, well, Cab Franc's a little different because that's, Cab Franc is different, but Cab Sauv, Merlot, um, Pinot Noir, you cannot do, you cannot touch American to a Pinot, and Sangiovese, you cannot touch American to a Sangiovese. And our Chardonnay too. Chardonnay. Only um, French. Certain varietals, you can only go French, and certain varietals thrive in American, Syrah, Grenache, um, Tempranillo. Um, some of those are just absolutely fantastic on American. So now when I look at my spice rack and all my flavors I can add, I can still, I can go, okay, I'm going to, I need some of the elegance of the French and a little bit of that spiciness, but I also need some coconut and vanilla to come through. So I'm going to add some Vir Virginia and some Virginia and maybe one uh, Pennsylvania into there. And so with those, then I can add, then I've got all my flavors and my spices in that wine. And then once we get to blending trials, then I say, oh, okay, now I've got all this fantastic base wine. It's only, since I've been talking about Barbera, it's only Barbera, but I've got like five different forests in this Barbera right now. So now I can go to blending and I can take from other wines that have similar spices or different spices and all that barrel program. And now I blend that into it. So now I'm blending not only um, to, to add a longer finish, but I'm also adding a little bit of um, eucalyptus or a little bit of the vanilla nut um, to that as well. So it goes, it goes tenfold when you can really look at making perfect wine start to finish. And then my last last thing to that is my crew. My crew now I've had, they've been with me for years and years now. Um, and every single person knows their job. They know how to do every aspect of the job. They know how to pitch in to, to whatever needs help. And so to have that consistency of the crew to know that each person is giving 100% into their, their specialty it just is making the best wines and quality wines. Not to say there's, I mean, in the earlier days, there's been a couple times when a newbie has come along. And I said, hey, go add this little bit of water to this wine right here in the beginning in fermentation. And they add three times the water I told them to. Or a third. Or a third, <laughs> one or the other. And I'm just, and then you're going, oh my God, now the chemistry's off, the science is off, and now I've got to work so much harder to fix that. Or in the lab, the bag that says diammonium phosphate is looks exactly the same as the bag that says uh, tartaric acid. So you have to look at the bag and make sure of what you're adding. And so we did have an issue at one point where someone did not, where they were just like, well, that, the bag that looks like that is this. And then... Yeah, they uh, added too much acid. To added acid when we weren't adding acid, we were adding diammonium phosphate. And so um, we just had to really pay very close attention to that. And, and one of the funny things this year, this last harvest that was funny is that we do all have our own jobs and we know our jobs well and we know the job that we have and how it relates to other people's jobs. Um, but our oldest daughter is a senior in high school and there was this one evening where she needed me to be home by a certain time 
to go to this online meeting with her for college prep. And so I was like, okay, everybody, I have to leave at this time. And so we talked about who was going to take my place and then who was going to take that person's place. And so um, Jess got to take my place in the winery and then Chris got to take Jess's place. And then Mo still kept Mo's place because we needed Mo to be Mo. Um, and then Nate had been gone during the day and like jumped in. And so it was very much like, I know my job, but wow, I didn't realize like how much everybody else was doing. And if it, we survived it, of course, but um, it, that's one of the great things about our crew is that we're just like, okay, we'll step in where, where we need to, but there is so much of that dynamic going on. And, and the great thing is that we do work so great together. And then the rest of our crew as well, I really love because our crew does harvest and they know every job on the, at harvest, every one of my crew members knows every job to be done at harvest because we do have to swap and take each other's jobs. And then when bottling comes, every member of our crew helps at bottling time because all hands on deck. And so they know every aspect of bottling. And then through right to the growing and me going to walk the vineyards and, and doing the lab work, everything, every part of my crew knows every part of the business. So that then when you come in on your Saturday or you come in whenever you guys are coming to pick up your wine, wine club, you're talking to somebody that knows every single aspect of the job. Whereas when you go to other tasting rooms, you're talking to a peon that has no idea. They, or they might, but no, no they don't. <laughs> you, absolutely not. You go into a tasting room, not one of those people has had their hands in those grapes. When you're a tasting room staff, you work the tasting room, you sell the wine, that's it. And occasionally you might get to catch the winemaker walking through. But other than that, nobody knows any part of it. So I really love that about our crew is that you talk to any one of my crew, they're as knowledgeable as I am in any part of the, the business. Maybe not the lab work and science part of it, but everything else, my crew knows every part of it. Oh yeah, I love when we're in the tasting room, which is my main area. But uh and people, I'm like, oh, yeah, we hand sort, we do this, we, this is our da-da-da, and they're just like, okay, and then I'm like, and they're like, oh, so you guys, like, hire people to come in and do that. I'm like, no, it's, we do that. That's what we all do, and Nate and Dre do such a great job of including us in all of those parts so that we do know, and I feel like it gives such a more confident uh, approach to, like, I know, I know about this wine. I know about how it went from grape to this bottle and how we're enjoying it right now and then you feel so like proud of it too because I'm like I helped make this and like it's such a intentional thing that we do here and I feel like it's the difference between having a meal cooked that's really good there's really beautiful and great wine out there but then having a meal cooked with love where it's just like I don't know what it is there's that extra step and I I definitely feel like you get that with Vina Moda and that's what makes it so great and such a great thing to be a part of. So yeah. Thanks. Jeff. My little two cents. Um, but we also had a question about suggested food pairings, which I know we're going to get into next, but I feel like that's a perfect, a perfect segue. Yeah. So, um, when we were putting this class together and I just was like, you know, I need to actually write down, suggested food pairing <laughs> because we'll eat something and have a wine with it and we'll go oh that's really good we should tell people about that but I don't and so we need to start doing that um but so one of the ones I know for sure that we recommended was the Zupa Toscana with the Phoenix it's very very good um it's a soup that is with ground turkey and then um some sweet potatoes and it has kale Mm -hmm. yeah really kale in it and it has coconut milk and it's very delicious it's a, a wonderful hearty soup um and definitely that pairs well with the phoenix and then we asked our resident chef marlene and she said sausage or grilled pork chops with roasted veggies and thyme and so that is her recommendation um for the phoenix and obviously we do eat food with the phoenix regularly <laughs> but I need to actually take notes on, on what we've enjoyed. So definitely it's not one of those bigger ones like Syrah where you, or uh, Petite Syrah where you want to pair it with something really, really huge. 
um, but any kind of white meat with it um, or anything savory would be really good with the Phoenix. And then always, anytime you're going to do any kind of, of soup or sauce or meat, if you're able to put a little bit of the wine into it during the cooking, um, not a lot, you don't have to do a lot, but if you put into it with the cooking, it really brings the flavors out um, with it. I do recall that the Phoenix is not great with super spicy food, um, or at least not the 2017. Uh, it's not super great with spicy food. It uh, just kind of becomes sharp and, and loses some of its uh, elegance because of the spice overwhelms it. Um, but the nice thing about the Primitivo base instead of Zinfandel is it has that little bit of spice to it already. Um, and so you can have that as an, an enhancement to your food rather than having to have it with something spicy, if that makes sense. Um, I feel like there was something else, Jess, that I was going to add to the end and I didn't write it down. Oh, uh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, so one of the other things, so while we were closed, um, we were putting together what we were calling the sommelier experience. And so I wanted to talk about that a little bit during the class. Um, we ended up going back to being able to do tastings. And so we haven't full on introduced it or advertised it, but we are going to uh, do a sommelier experience for our wine club members or anyone that uh, creates an, uh, an appointment prior to the day. So nothing drop in, that's something that we can do. But in that, we have the, um, which I was going to actually show earlier when Nate was talking about the smells and flavors of the, the Phoenix, but we have our wine wheel where it talks about different aromas and it talks about, or this is the aroma side, this is the flavor side. And so one of the nice things that we can walk people through when you come in for a tasting, we're pouring for you as well as multiple other people. And so we can talk a little bit about the wine, but we can't stay and like really experience it with you. But if you were to do a sommelier experience, then we can walk you through those. And then each table gets its own aroma, or flavor wheel and aroma wheel. And then we have uh, a, description, a description here where we talk about the aromas, where we have the first nose, which is something that is talked a lot about more in France than it is here in the U.S., but where you pour the wine into the glass and then you smell it without adding any oxygen to it. And then you get to experience its evolution as you do oxygenate it and swirl it. And so it's just another aspect of the aroma experience. And then you go into the primary aromas and that those are the really uh, robust aromas. So you uh, swirl it and you smell it and you smell it from up here and you smell it from down low and you just kind of experience those different aromas. Then you go and look at the color clarity, the outer rings, um, the legs. And then we wanted you to, during this smelly experience, close your eyes and experience the tertiary aroma. So the tertiary, tertiary aromas are what happens as the wine opens, as it ages, as it oxygenates. And so that's also something where if you were to decant a wine, you would be able to experience the difference between the primary aromas and the tertiary aromas. And then we would lead you into tasting it. And then you would identify the mouthfeel and the flavors. And then we would determine, is it black fruit? Is it red fruit? Things like that. And then once you were to finish your wine, then we would have you wait with that empty glass for a couple of minutes and not put any wine in there. Let the aromas and flavors stay in your nose and your mouth and then smell the glass, the empty glass after it's been sitting empty for a few minutes. And then you get to experience the secondary aromas, which is where you get to experience the barrel program. You get to experience the wine making influence. And then you can really have, um, an experience with something that normally if, you go ahead and empty your glass and then you put more wine in it or you just empty your glass and you put it away. You don't get to experience the secondary aromas. And so when you have the glass empty for a little while and then you smell it again, all of the aromas from the barrel, as Nate was talking about with the, the spice rack, those are just waiting to be discovered in that empty glass. And that's also something that's really important when you're tasting wine anywhere. If you go ahead and let your glass stay empty for a few minutes and then you smell it, that 
gives you a really, really, really good clue about that winery's barrel program. If it smells like dirty dog, if it smells like cellar, if it smells like barnyard, if it smells old dank, barn wood, like um, that really tells you a lot about their barrel program. And so um, at Vina Moda, because we are now fortunately able to really dial in our barrel program, and it's something that's ever since 2013, we made it a huge priority to always have the ideal barrel program on the wines because that was something that's been Nate's dream for a lot of years um, that we'll give up other things in our lives <laughs> so that we can make sure to have the barrel program that presents the wine in its best possible light and not everyone takes the time to smell the glass after or recognizes what the barrel program brings to the table. Yeah, so your homework tonight is when you get done drinking your wine, like five to eight minutes after your glass is done, it's empty, empty, it's done, smell your glass. Because most smell people here, never, never like take this. the chance to do that. Just in, in and out, like sometimes when you stick your nose way down in there, you're going to get certain aromas. And then if you kind of just smell from up here, you're going to get different aromas. It approaches your um, olfactory senses in a different way. And then also if you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, you're really um, bringing your super taste buds into effect. And so, and the same thing when you're going to drink the wine in through your nose, out through your mouth, because it invigorates those taste buds. And so even if you're smelling the empty glass and you smell in through your nose and out through your mouth, you can literally taste the influence of the barrels on your tongue, even though you haven't put anything in your mouth, which is really a fun experience. And so that's something that we were spending some time developing when we thought that we were not gonna be able to give tasting for a while. But we do still want to offer that because it's a really amazing experience for those who wanna go through it. And then we have, we developed um, this little thing here where you can go through and like circle the different things that you smell and taste. You can circle the different mouthfeel. Of, you can uh, determine the level of tannins and acid all the way from non-existent to overpowering, the finish from non-existent to very long, the body from light to full, the color from red to white to rosé. And then we even have this um, printout where we show you the different levels of color and what they're called in the glass. So when you take your glass, and then you look at it, you look at it in light, and then you look at it, and then you can start to identify, is this a pale garnet? Is this a medium ruby? And then sometimes it's between the two. And it's just a fun thing to do if you really want to explore your wine on the next level. And so uh, Nate is doing one on March, whatever the next Saturday it's like is. Next the first, Saturday, isn't yeah, it? not this Saturday in February, right? The next, next one. Saturday. Um, so one of our wine club members had when we had started posting like little things of, well, we're starting to develop this and it's her birthday. And so she asked if she could go ahead and do that. So that'll be our first actual one that we do that wasn't experimental. Um, but we do want to go ahead and, and proceed with that, even though we are able to, to do tastings now, because we just really feel like anyone who wants to take their wine tasting and wine knowledge to the next level, we would love to be the ones to take you there. So um, we'll start doing some marketing and things with it after Nate does this first one in March. But if you're interested in it at all, just reach out and we would love to do that for you. And we can do uh, parties up to eight, right, Jeff, in the big table, um, including one of us. And so normally, if you were to take do this sensory experience that UC gave it, it costs $550. And so it's really awesome that you can come and experience that at Vina Moda and with Vina Moda Wines and, and take that to take your experience to the next level without having to pay that kind of money. Um, and so it's just something that we're really excited to, to bring to Vina Moda and to bring to our wine club members. And I'm sure we'll also open it up to other people that aren't wine club members that want to do it as well. But, um, but we're just going to start out offering it to our wine club and, and see what you think of it. And, so, and if you have any questions about that, make sure to, to add that to the chat or now that we're kind of wrapping up on what we had planned to talk about, I'd love to open up to any questions that anyone has about anything that we've talked about or anything that we haven't talked about that you're curious about. Um, so uh, AZ does have a question for you and then um, getting some questions about the sensory experience. And so 
Um, this is something you can schedule with us. Uh, we have like, a, just so happens that we have our first official one scheduled for the first Saturday in March, but uh, this is something you can schedule with us whenever, or, you know, on our normal Sunday. Yes. Around. And, um, <laughs> but it's not, and like Dre said earlier, it's just, it's not something where if you show up to the tasting room on a Saturday that we're going to be able to just do on that Saturday. It's got to be scheduled ahead of time because the whole, it's an experience that we want one person. We need to dedicate somebody with you the entire time. And so, um, you know, just communicate with us and we can make it happen. And AZ, I'm going to pass it over to you for your question. I was super curious about the barrel profiles. Like, so when you are ordering your barrels and you like, do you order certain barrels for a Barbera and then a certain barrels for Phoenix? And do they come with like tasting notes on the barrel, right? Like you have tasting notes for, well, there's a brain. Yeah, no, no. It took me years to figure out what barrel does what because certain coopers make different then you can toast so every single forest that i talked about you can toast them from a light to a medium to a heavy to a heavy plus and you can toast the staves or the heads or both the staves and the head yeah so you can get a more impactful barrel and so no it took me years to figure out what the heck was even why this barrel i mean they say in at uc davis i learned that French barrels are more the spicy, American barrels are more the cream and vanilla. So, but that's that, not very specific. That's not very specific <laughs> no. at all. And so, and then certain varietals now over years of working with it and trying, and luckily all my clients have been receptive to me practicing and trying. Um, so at all the different wineries that I make wine for, I try, I try different things because different vineyards are different. I can get Barbera at one place. I go get Barbera somewhere else. It tastes totally different. It's it's crazy. Just the terroir, especially up here in California in the Sierra foothills. Um, our volcanic soil, five miles down the road, you're getting a totally different ball game. I mean, it some is schist, schisty loam, some is sandy loam, some is clay rock. Um, and the like percentage of grade of and then the grade uh, you're either hillside or your valley floor um all of that makes a huge and impact on what you do east west so for for years so american virginia is one of my favorite american barrels but that only works on certain varietals i used to go virginia on grenache all the time but virginia overpowers grenache you got to go minnesota for virginia or That's for uh, grenache um pinot noir you can't touch an american barrel to it it can only go french and it only needs to go like light on the french like sylvain then you go get into petite syrah i was going virginia on petite syrah and syrah for a long time because i just knew virginia was one of my favorite barrels and everything i put into it came out really creamy a lot of coconut and a lot of vanilla to it um but so barbera the one that we talked about loves Virginia. I love Virginia on that. But then I was doing that with Petit Sera and Syrah. Well, then I started experimenting with Pennsylvania there. Pennsylvania gives it that bacony, meaty, mm. bacony, little barbecuey, smoky, just gorgeous for like a big chewy Petit Sera or Syrah. Add some cream layers too. But then I don't only go 100% Pennsylvania on something like that. Yeah, nothing's I'll 100%. Go, I'll go five barrels Pennsylvania and I'll do two in Virginia. So I'm still getting a little bit of coconut and cream, but I'm also getting all that like fatty bacon with it as well on certain varietals. And then he's not 100% committed. So every month he does a topping of the winery. And when he's doing the topping, he smells and tastes the wine of every single barrel. And if it's too much or if it's not enough, then he's like, okay, well, we need to wrap this out of this and put it into that. And or so, sometimes it's too much. I'm going, oh crap, the oak's a little bit heavy on this. We got to pull it out now. I'll pull it out and see where those barrels would best be suited somewhere else. And then put it into like a once used French or something instead of a, a brand new American. And so he's constantly paying attention to how every single barrel is doing. And that's why when we talk about 
the fact that our barrels are boutique hand tended wine, literally hand tended every month, smelling, tasting, making sure that they're perfect. Because, you know, if you're doing it wrong, then it ruins the barrel and then you're out 60 gallons of wine. So one time we put Grenache into a once used French barrel and um, the barrel itself was just was a little funky. funky and it, we, it, we couldn't come back from that because Grenache is too tender. It's just, it's too susceptible to influence. And so after that, it's like, oh, okay, no, we can't do that. And so, and it, it was within a month. It was put it in there and within a month, going back and smelling it and tasting it, it already influenced it too much. And so um, it, it really is a check match in Nate's head constantly. So after you do your blending trials, right, you come up with your perfect blend. Mm -hmm. And then like, how many barrels do you put that into to see how that works? Because it's well, almost like another trial, right? So we pull an aggregate sample of every single barrel of that varietal so that we know oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we're tasting that it is if we were to put all the wine from every single barrel of like Grenache, if we were to pull it, that, that is exactly what it would taste like. Gotcha. And so we can't just pull a sample from one barrel because it's not, it's not an accurate And sample. we do our blending after it's been in barrel for almost two years. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. we need we need about two and a half to three months before bottling um, to know our exact blends, our amount. So because we have to order all our glass, um, all the glass for the the, the reds, and then the labels, and then the screw caps, and everything has to be ordered months in advance. So that's why we always do ours. So instead of doing Christmas like traditional people do, we blend. So we we blend, we blend, we blend, and then we fast right after for our health. And uh, so every Christmas into New Year's, that's what we do. Is our blending. And then that way by March, we know exactly everything that we're, is going into it. We have time for all the glass to show up and all our labels to be made and be in line, the bottler, everything to be done, ready. Interesting, complicated. Thank you. You do a great yeah. job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's the fun part. We truly love the blending part. I mean, that's that's one of our favorite parts. But then once it goes from blending into bottling, that's my least favorite time of <laughs> of the year. It's the messy time. It's and, and we've got to rack all of those barrels out, make all the blends to perfection. Everything has to be down to the one percent. Um, so we got to make all of that, get everything in, and then I have to go through the process of filtration. And filtration is just a pain in the ass. Sick forever. It just every wine has to go through a micron filter and it's picking out all the big sediment and stuff out and of it. And we start at one level and we have to go once and then yeah, twice. Yeah, so we start at seven hundreds and that's the big coarse filter. That takes out the big, big like they call that like a bug the catcher. Leaves, which we don't have bugs in our wine to the sort, but they call that the bug catcher level. So you catch all the big stuff there, then we go down to 300s, then we drop to 150s, then we drop down to 80s, then we drop down to EK fully sterile. So the wine has to go through all those levels to get finally to where we can put it in bottle. And every, every day, and then within 72 hours, within 72 hours of going through a filtration cycle, the wine becomes, then it loses its sterility and it, it binds again and then you have to go back through the same process so every wine has to be through every level of filtration and down to fully sterile within 72 hours of going into bottle so with making as much wine as i make and for the several clients i make for we have to have all the wines perfect we um, have this giant calendar and every day is a day of what exactly is happening that day um, getting ready for bottling. So everything is lined out very specifically in a very giant way so that we all know exactly what's going on. I leave a couple days in between <laughs> just in case we have a equipment breakdown failure. But within 72 hours of going into bottle, every wine has been adjusted with all of its chemistry, all the levels of SO2, acidity, everything is done 100% fully filtered by that time, 72 hours before we go into bottle. Yeah. So we and have- a pain in the ass. 
Yeah. <laughs> Two questions. And even though this was asked secondly, I'm going to, because it kind of correlates to what we're talking about right now. But um, Chuck wants to know what happens to the flavor through the filtering. And then we have another question that goes back to the barrels um, and the 17 Phoenix. But I'll have you answer the filtering uh, flavor question first. Okay. Good, good question, Chuck. Um, we go into what's called bottle shock. Has, in, has everybody out there seen the movie Bottle Shock? Yeah, okay. So it goes into what is called bottle shock and it's where everything starts to split in the wine as we're going through. Molecular, at a molecular level. Yeah, so it's not actually the atoms are split, that's nuclear physics at that point, but the wine itself, everything starts to split and it goes through this torturous filtration process. And so the wine is not, it's the, the best way I can describe it is static electricity. Mm -hmm. When you're drinking the wine or tasting the wine, it tastes like static electricity. And it's, it tastes like you screwed it up, honestly, towards <laughs> the end, towards those last, last cycles and running through that you can't i'm tasting the wine and it's so for me i drink a lot of beer during parts of my year i almost can't stand the taste of wine through certain parts of my year bottling and harvest so bottling <laughs> especially because every time i make a transition through so we use these filter pads the filter pads for one cycle of filtration is 80 dollars, and i can only push through maybe 800 gallons we make four to 5,000 gallons each year. I can maybe push through seven, 800 gallons, and then I've got this changeover. So we're looking at an 80, $90 changeover. But you don't want, when you're doing the changeover, you don't want the previous wine to influence the next wine. Right, so let me finish. Sorry. So as I'm pushing through, it starts to, the pads start to plug up. And so it starts going slower and slower and slower to a point where I'm like, okay, hopefully I can get through this wine and then I'll change the pads over. But it gets to a point where even if it's going fast or slow, I have to make that change at some point. And so if I'm moving to a new wine, say from Barbera to Syrah, I don't want, like I said earlier, Barbera does not play well with others. So I do not want one drop of Barbera to go into the Syrah. But when it goes in from Barbera, I pumping Barbera through the through it then I start pumping Syrah once I'm done with the Barbera now I'm pumping Syrah through the lines into the filter and then out the lines into the tank so right there at the filter I have to be there tasting just constantly leaning down and just with my bare hand with a little valve open there just tasting 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 and I'm tasting Barbera the second I taste anything different than Barbera I know stop stop right there now i'm going to change tanks and i can start pumping into a new tank that's now barbera tank versus it was syrah tank and so i'm tasting wine every single change we make and like i said we make like 14 different wines now and that's just for vina moda then i do villa and all my other clients as well so every single change of every single varietal every wine has to go five times through the filter to get through all the all the different pads so i'm just tasting wine tasting 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 every time i get a change okay stop then we run through that and then sometimes we'll have to just stop all the way because the pads filled up then we have to stop everything change over it takes 45 minutes per change so every time we lose 45 minutes in our day so on the last about 100 hours of filtration we don't the filter never stops the pump never stops we sleep hours. we sleep at the winery i have there are actually a couple dog beds and we bring sleeping bags oh and, we bring a mattress well the last time we brought a mattress the year before <laughs> was freaking dog beds but we're there and we're going 24 hours a day because we can't stop or we're not going to make it in time and just tasting wine constantly to get the change to when did it change when did it change there's no gauge on any filter or pump that says oh this new wine is here now it's all about the change in the flavor so it just gets to a point where you're just it's absolute burnout and 
just trying to not screw up because we've been so good and so flawless through every aspect of what we're doing. We just can't screw up that last little bit. Well, and we can't do it any sooner because as Nate said, as we're yeah, it's doing, 72 hours, it's 72 hours. And so Nate, uh, and then Mo, uh, Marlene slash Mo, who is our seller master, it's the two of them primarily. And then I try to bring them food and then come and try to hang out with whoever's awake while someone takes a nap. We play a lot of Yahtzee. Um, because we have to just wait and watch, wait and watch, wait and watch, wait and watch, and then taste and, and switch. Yeah, we call it the hurry up and wait. Yes. <laughs> and so when we make a change, we haul ass and it's as fast as we can get it done. But then we've got eight, seven hours of this one wine going through. But and you have so, to sit there and watch But it. we got to be there in case something happens or something pops. We can't leave. So just super laborious at that point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then also we have a, a cross flow filter, um, which is an investment that we made a couple of years ago. We used to just have a single flow filter. And, uh, and then we also do a very gentle filtration. So you can make it go faster through the filter, um, but it's going to be even more traumatic on the wine. And so Nate is very, it's very important to him that we do a very gentle slow filtration but now that we have the cross flow filter we're able to um do the gentle filtration but it still moves at a little bit faster rate mm -hmm. is that accurate so it was just something that we had to invest in the more clients we took on that are bottling at the same time as us one year it was nate mo and i were just at the winery for two weeks straight just not able to one person took a nap while that was a dog bed yeah we did bring a mattress, I'm telling you. Um, but after that, we did get the cross flow filter um, because it is so important to us to keep the integrity of the wine, but it is more laborious to do that. So, yeah. Um, we had a so question about the, barrel. the other question goes back to the barrel program. And uh, I believe it was Lindsay who asked, or sorry, let me see where the question is. Oh shoot, did we lose uh, Lindsay? We might have. Oh, I hope that doesn't mean the question went away. It was, what is the um, like barrel components for the 2017 Phoenix? But now I'm not seeing it, so I'm wondering if it's... Deirdre and Dave said that after Phoenix glass smells like lovely flowers, and then... Mm -hmm. It was us on the question about the uh, barrels too, and we we're just wondering what you know what forests are in the 2017 Phoenix. Okay, that was it. The barrel mix. Uh, are these? Does this have French oak or is this? A... No, this this one um, is a hundred percent American driven. Um, we did into the Primitivo. Where I'm using. Because Primitivo is a little bit on the lighter side in the body texture, like a Grenache. So I'm using primarily Minnesota wood in there, which just makes more of an elegance. It's very similar to a French barrel um, in the Minnesota, but at a far better cost and not quite as spicy. It still has a little bit more of the American cream to it. So uh, we, that's primarily Minnesota and the Primitivo. The Tanat gets a little bit more Virginia and a little bit more because it's similar to a Petite Syrah, so I add more of that Pennsylvania to it. So um, in that, in the 17, and then the Morved, that was the only one that did get a little bit of French. So there's a tiny bit of French influence from the Morved, but it was the last blending component. So it would make it at no more than a 5% of the entire blend got some French. Yeah, but it was only 8% in the bed. So. Yeah, so I would say it's like, yeah, 2 3% got actual French oak to it, but primarily Minnesota for its elegance and beauty, um, and then a little bit of Pennsylvania to add some of that meaty, a um, little more bacony quality to it. And then, yeah, that, that last little finish would be a little bit more of the little touch of spice to it from the more bed. Are there any other questions before we wrap this up? No? Or would anybody like to say their, like mention their thoughts about the Phoenix or the, yeah. anything like that? I'd love to hear what you have to say. I will. I was just going to type it in, but it's a lot easier to say it. 
Yeah. The 2017 Phoenix is really tricky. It fools you, um, or at least it fools me, because when I smell it and when I take my first taste, it, it's it's like it's going to be really sweet and and like like almost too sweet. Well, that's that's not fair because I like sweet, but but then when it hits your tongue, it surprises you. It's like nope, it's it's not that. It's got it's got a lot more um, complexity to it. There's a lot of spice. There's there's a lot of of uh, this. Um, um, almost like a, like a, a, I don't want to say, it's like a tart fruit to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And Nate sometimes describes it as like a cactus flower where there are these certain aromatics, but then the cactus is pokey. <laughs> yeah. And well, that's a really good way to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I also get a little bit of like a dustiness and leather as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's just this kind of, when I think of the Phoenix and I'm drinking the Phoenix, I think of that like sunset or even a sunrise where it's that the, the light has changed and it's this kind of murky, red, smoky, a little bit hazy, dusty with a little bit of leather. And I think of like the Comancheros or the Cowboys coming off of a ride and their leather saddles and just that kind of haze of the the red hues through the light and the little bit of dustiness from the desert and the wind blowing a little bit and then that the cactus fruit and seeing those nopalitos on the big prickly pear cactus and stuff and that's that is phoenix to me to a t yeah it it's almost... got a little bit of a grit to it that's like sand but you don't want to describe it as gritty right right I, and I, I, I totally get I, I get the whole color um, that that you're that you're going for there, Nathan, because it's it's like it's got this reddish orange. It's not like it tastes like orange. It tastes like the color orange. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. Isn't that a trip? It's crazy. Yeah. And that's in the tasting notes. I talk about it. Billows to blood orange and it's like it's not that it tastes like oranges it's yeah. the color of blood orange right exactly the taste of the color of blood orange which but that little bit of tartness <laughs> that you say could be a little bit of perceived from a little bit of an acidic of a blood orange so yes. mm -hmm. yep. oh yeah all right well i'm going to just stop the recording for it. And so this is our uh, Phoenix Red Blend class, um, but that doesn't mean that everyone has to go. I'm just gonna let everyone know I'm stopping the recording now.